How about living in a country, a digital nomad destination that is so young, so new and so secret that many people neither know that it exists nor where it is. A country that is small enough for you to discover all of it in your stay and thus really getting to know its people and its culture. A country that has 117 beaches with glittering blue, crystal clear water, kilometers of unspoiled coastline, rugged, impressive mountains to hike, the second deepest canyon in the world, plenty of untouched nature, one of Europe's greatest biodiversities, and can impress with millennia of eventful history that can be still discovered today. The country I am talking about is Montenegro, which even translates to Black Mountain. Montenegro is a Balkan country bordering Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, which we will actually take a closer look at next week, Serbia, Kosovo and Albania. It also has a very beautiful coastline by the Adriatic Sea. Its capital is Podgorica, which by the way is noted to be the rainiest city in Europe, with an average of 65.4 inches of rain each year. Otherwise, its landscape is absolutely breathtaking, with rugged mountains, medieval villages and a narrow strip of beaches along the Adriatic coastline, making it a perfect destination for water sport enthusiasts, avid hikers and history buffs. Everyone will find something to discover here. The Bay of Kotor, one of Montenegro's highlights, resembles a fjord surrounded by pretty villages and medieval churches. Montenegro is also Europe's youngest country, only having reached independence from Serbia in 2006. Yet, like the entire region, it of course has a very turbulent and eventful history that we will take a closer look at in a minute. Montenegro is a very small country, with a population of only around 620,000. This means you can really discover a lot of it during your visit. And if you prefer the quieter life, you will be able to find that as well. Its size also makes Montenegro a great stepping stone to many of the other countries in the region. Montenegro's official language is Montenegrin, but as everywhere in the region, the younger population usually is able to communicate in English as well. When you get a bit off the beaten track, however, you won't get far with English. Knowledge of German or Russian would be helpful though. Montenegrin used to be written in the Cyrillic alphabet, but after a language reform can now be written both in Latin or Cyrillic, with Latin spellings being widely used, so you should be able to read it just fine as well. Montenegro is neither in the EU nor in the Schengen zone, which makes it a perfect place to sit out your Schengen clock if you, for example, have just visited its now Schengen neighbor, Croatia. Even though it is not in the EU, it nevertheless uses the euro as currency. Currently, 1 euro equals 1.08 US dollars. Its climate is Mediterranean with hot summers and mild winters by the sea. Keep in mind that many places in Europe don't commonly use air condition, so plan for that when you come in summer. However, winters will be cold and snowy in the mountains and you will even find some really nice ski slopes there. When it comes to choosing the best time to travel to Montenegro, it might be a good idea to avoid the high season in summer from July to August. Montenegro is packed with tourists during these months and it gets very crowded. Over 2 million tourists visit this small country on a yearly basis. There are a lot of cruise ships stopping in Montenegro as well, meaning that the towns by the Adriatic Sea that have a port deep enough for the big ships to stop will A. have a lot less of a beautiful view and B. even more importantly will be flooded with the visitors that will be making their way through the narrow old town streets like a tidal wave at certain intervals. 
If you come too far in the off season, however, be prepared that many of the tourist activities will be closed and unavailable. Therefore, for the best experience, at least by the coast, the shoulder seasons might be the best. Be aware that Montenegro has a tourist tax of about 1 euro per day. Once you arrive in Montenegro, you will have to register in whichever little town or village you stay. Usually, if you stay at a hotel, they take care of this for you. If you stay with an Airbnb host, they should hopefully be aware of how this works. But if they don't mention it to you, make sure to ask them. Should you not register and therefore not pay the tourist tax, you will be fined when you leave the country. Before moving on to the digital nomad must-haves, let's take a quick look at Montenegro's history. I always feel that knowing the history of a country that you want to visit is an absolute must. Not only to get closer to the people and the culture and to understand them better, but even more importantly, to ensure that as guests we don't accidentally step on people's toes and, you know, commit a lot of cultural faux pas. Not to mention that in the case of Montenegro, like the entire Balkan area, its very recent history has left some traces behind that are very unpleasant and that you absolutely need to know about when you travel there. But let's talk about the good parts first. Montenegro, like the entire region, has millennia of interesting history, with many of the mightiest empires of their time having conquered or at least tried to conquer the country at some point. Some regions of what is now Montenegro were part of the Roman Empire leaving you with some very interesting ruins to discover. The Ottoman Empire too controlled some of the area, as well as the Venetians who gave the country the name it has today. Monte, mountain, negro, black, leading to Black Mountain. In 1918, Montenegro joined the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, or the land of the South Slavs with the regions of Kosovo and Vada Macedonia, as well as the Kingdom of Montenegro unifying with Serbia, a decision that continues to be very relevant today. In 1941, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, after a coup d'etat, overthrew the Kingdom's ruler, Prince Paul, making way for the formation of the Democratic Federal Yugoslavia under Josip Broz Tito, which I talked more about in the video about Serbia. Tito came to power in 1943. There was some back and forward and of course some conflict in the process, but Tito's Yugoslavia, now called the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, became a prosperous state encompassing basically all of the Balkans in a semi-autonomous state. After Tito died in 1980, tensions increased and eventually the state crumbled, leading to a horrible war in which the different states strived for independence. The Yugoslav Wars from 1991 to 2001 were a very horrific part of quite recent European history. They were fueled by nationalism, religious ideologies and ethnic conflict. I hope you will forgive me this black and white description of what happened there. Of course it wasn't that black and white. Not everybody participated, not everybody believed in these ideologies. As always when it comes to politics, the reality of course was a lot more nuanced. I'm just trying to give you the framework or the basic facts of what happened, to give you a broader understanding of the region and what it went through. A lot of horrible war crimes like genocide and systematic rape were committed during these wars. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed. And at its end, the independent states of Croatia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Macedonia, which due to a dispute with Italy now is called North Macedonia, but that's a topic for an upcoming video, Slovenia and the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, which consisted of Serbia, the former seat of Tito and Montenegro, emerged. One of the Yugoslav wars was also Kosovo's fight for independence from Serbia. The country declared independence, but it is not accepted as an independent region by Serbia and some other countries to this day. And lately, the tensions on the Serbian-Kosovo border have been very high once again. Check out the Serbia video if you want to know more. Why am I telling you all of this in a video about Montenegro, you wonder? Well, because this part of the story is really important for you if you are in Montenegro. Why? Well, keep in mind that at that time, Montenegro was still part of Serbia. Therefore, 
The border that Montenegro shares with Kosovo was part of the war zone in the war between Serbia and Kosovo. And it has left behind some very ugly and dangerous reminders. Landmines. There are still a lot of unexploded landmines near the border with Kosovo. Do not leave the main paths. Not even to just go behind some bush by the side of the road to know, take care of your business. If you are in the area, stay on the path at all times. Usually these areas will be marked with red signs, so make sure to watch out for those. Montenegro itself declared independence from Serbia in 2006, which, as I had mentioned in the introduction, makes it the youngest country in Europe. I want to stress once again that this is of course a very brief and incomplete account of the history of that time. I as a foreigner have neither the knowledge nor the right to judge what happened there and what true impact it had on the people. If you travel to Montenegro and the entire region of the Balkans, I can only implore you to take the time to learn about the history by visiting its memorial sites, its museums and you know, you get deeper into the history of the area. The one thing that you should probably not do is talk about it to people, make broad statements, ask people about this. Everybody in the area that is alive today has had somebody lost, somebody hurt, somebody displaced by these wars. And you never know which kind of traumas these people have under the surface. So try to be mindful of that. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about digital nomad infrastructure. Meaning things that you as a digital nomad need to be able to live your lifestyle. First on the list, as always, internet. Internet is cheap and reliably available in the bigger cities, particularly in the capital. However, the further away from the bigger cities you will be, the slower the internet will become. And up in some of the mountain villages, it might even be unavailable. So keep that in mind when considering work and travel plans. You can buy very inexpensive SIM cards with 500 gigabyte data packages for 15 euros or less. That will help you with your connectivity issues. You will also be able to find co-working spaces in the bigger cities, though the concept is quite new. Working from your accommodation might be something to consider for many. Cafes are also available. The region has a big coffee culture. However, working from cafes is not something that is super common, so it might depend a little on how you feel comfortable. People might stare, not in hostility, just because they are wondering what you are doing and why. Hence my suggestion about working from home if you feel uncomfortable with that. When it comes to infrastructure, Montenegro has two airports. One in the capital, Podgorica, and the other in Tivat. Unlike in many other countries, it is not the capital airport that has the most tourists arrive, but the one in Tivat since it is an entry point to the touristy coastline destinations. However, this makes Tivat a rather seasonal airport. Another option to get around in the country or enter from a neighboring country cheaply is via bus. Montenegro has a well-organized bus system. However, as everywhere in the Balkans, some might find the driving style, shall we say, adventurous. The winding mountain roads and optimistic overtaking maneuvers might feel quite scary to some. As always, you will find links to different travel resources such as accommodation, car rentals, bus tickets, tours and visa services in the description. Using those when you make your travel arrangements supports me and my channel at no additional cost to you. Train rides are, besides self-driving, a favorite mode of transportation for me. For one, this is because I get horribly motion sick and usually I'm confined to staring out the window in misery when in a bus or a car that I am not driving myself. Not so in trains though. The other reason is that you get to see a lot of the country. You can move around and stretch your legs when needed and you can even get some good uninterrupted work hours in if you like. Train service in Montenegro isn't as extensive as the bus network but it does cross the entire country and is very inexpensive. Plus, you don't have to deal with the adventurous driving styles. You should know, however, that the railway system in Montenegro is a far cry from the modernized system you might find in other European countries. 
The trains are old and quite slow. Montenegro has one of Europe's most beautiful train routes, the one from Bar to Belgrade in Serbia. So if you take only one train ride, make it that one. It passes through absolutely stunning landscape. Another option to get around independently and surprisingly inexpensive is by car. The road conditions are good, though as I already mentioned the roads are quite windy. You won't have to lug your luggage around, you can visit some of the beautiful remote villages and you can generally stop wherever you desire. You will of course still have to deal with the driving style of the other traffic participants, but at least you are in control of the vehicle you are in. Uber or anything like that does not exist, so you will have to rely on cabs. Make sure the meter is running to avoid being overcharged. When it comes to accommodation, Airbnbs will probably be your best choice if you are setting up a home base in one of the bigger cities for a couple of weeks. When considering to stay longer than a couple of months, renting an apartment is another really good option that will be a lot less expensive. Check out the different expat groups on Facebook for help with that. For your shorter trips around the country, Montenegro of course also offers hotels and hostels, as well as two special accommodation options. The first one is one you can find all over the region, in-home stays. Here you stay at a family's home, like a bed and breakfast. This will give you a great opportunity to support small local businesses, learn more about the people and culture, taste delicious homemade food and get some secret tips on the region. Along Ada Boyana you can also stay in a very special accommodation, water cottages, which are like floating bungalows. Cost of living. Generally, Montenegro is a very inexpensive destination in Europe. However, if you are on a very tight budget, you should keep in mind that prices increase significantly the closer you get to the coastal region and of course even more so during the peak tourist season. As usual, my numbers come from Numio and have been translated to US dollars to make it more comparable for everybody watching this video. An inexpensive meal in a restaurant will cost you at average 7 US dollars and 59 cents. A cappuccino will cost you 1 dollar and 70 cents. A monthly transport pass will cost you 35 US dollars and 51 cents. Taxi tariff starts at 1 dollar and 8 cents and one kilometer taxi ride will cost you 87 cents. Waiting in traffic in a cab for one hour will cost you $6.50. Basic utilities for an 85 square meter apartment for one month will cost you $116.28. Internet for a month will cost you $27.17. And a one bedroom apartment in the city center, meaning for a long term lease, not an Airbnb, will cost you $452. A one-room apartment outside of the city center, on the other hand, will cost you on average 328 US dollars. As I said, keep in mind these are average prices. Depending on where you stay and when you will stay there, prices will be either a lot higher or a lot lower. Where to stay, meaning where to meet fellow digital nomads and experts, where's your best chance of getting the digital nomad infrastructure that you need, and where to put up your home base. Usually in all my videos I recommend the capital because the capital tends to have the best digital nomad infrastructure and the most digital nomads living in it. This is technically also true for Montenegro. However, the capital has by many a travel blogger been described as possibly the ugliest capital in Europe. Podgorica has a small but growing digital nomad and expat community. It has the most co-working spaces and cafes and the fastest internet. It also offers all the conveniences you might be used to from city life, like gyms, shopping malls, bars, museums and more. However, like I just said, many travel bloggers in particular agree that the city really isn't pretty. This is most likely due to the brutalist Soviet architecture. And as I mentioned earlier, it also rains basically all the time, leaving you with a dilemma of choosing between convenience and aesthetics. An interesting fact might be that while the capital, Podgorica is not the seat of the president, who resides in the old capital of the country, Cetinje. This makes Montenegro one of two countries in Europe with two capitals, with the other one being in the Netherlands and its two cities of Den Haag and Amsterdam. We will take a closer look at Cetinje 
in the things to do section. But know that these two cities are the only ones that would classify as bigger cities in Montenegro. So if that's what you're after, one of those would be your best bet. If you don't mind staying in a smaller town and would like to be close to coast, Kotor might be a good place for you. Kotor is a very popular tourist destination by the coast, though inland, connected to the Adriatic Sea by a fjord-like bay area. It is surrounded by mountains on the other sides. It has really stunning medieval Venetian architecture and a calm and easy-going lifestyle. If it isn't flooded with tourists during peak season, that is. Its old town is also a great place to rent your accommodation. You will be immersed in the fairy tale like architecture and in walking distance to most amenities and the beach. Kotor's old town is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site and one of the best preserved old towns in the Balkans. Particularly the old bazaar is, though touristy, very beautiful. From the old town you can also hike up to the castle of San Giovanni, also known as St. John's Fortress, where you will have the perfect view over the entire bay area, which it was built to protect. The climb up does require a base level of fitness and should probably not be made in midday heat. You will have to climb 1,355 steps to get to it. It too is an UNESCO heritage site and dates to the 9th century. It's one of the best historic remnants in the city, though it is mostly crumbled now. But there are several stone walls, fortifications and foundations still in place. There are also over 4.5 kilometers, that would be 2.8 miles of defensive walls. Another way to get to the fortress is to hike the ladder of Kotor. This hike is longer, but takes you past some beautiful old churches and stunning views. There even is a beautiful little cheese shop en route, where you can stop for a break and some snacks or a cup of coffee. Possibly the cheese shop with one of the best views in the world. You will find its exact location on Google Maps. This way also allows you to get to the fortress without paying the 10 euro entrance fee. When in the old town, make sure to step by St. Trifon's Cathedral, which is not only one of the most impressive buildings in Kotor, it is also one of the only two Roman Catholic cathedrals in the whole of Montenegro. By the way, St. Trifon is the patron of Kotor. And in your spare time, you can alternate between spending time by the beach and hiking and discovering some of the stunning mountain area that surrounds Kotor. Or you can take a boat trip to an artificial island off the coast of Perast, in the Bay of Kotor, Our Lady of the Rocks. It is one of the region's biggest tourist attractions. There are different legends as to how the island came to be. Some say that large, old ships filled with stones were sunk here. Others say that seamen, after each return from a sea voyage, threw rocks into the ocean to honor the Lady Madonna. Either way, the island is definitely worth a visit. Peras itself actually is also well worth a visit and we will get back to it in the things to do section. Before deciding on Kotor on your base, you should probably be aware however that Kotor does not receive any direct sunlight for a good portion of the years because it is shaded by the mountains. Internet in Kotor is still decent and reliable, and you are close to many great activities and tourist attractions. Its digital nomad community is small but growing, and though it is a very small town with just about 13,000 inhabitants, it does have several small co-working spaces, as well as plenty of cafes. Plus, the Tivat airport is only 10 to 15 minutes car ride away. Tivat, located in the Bay of Kotor, also has a co-working space that even hosts events, meetups and courses, allowing you to connect with other digital nomads. So let's give Tivat a closer inspection, shall we? Tivat is beautiful, no question there. And it has a convenient digital nomad infrastructure, as I mentioned. So why not move directly to Tivat? You absolutely could and should, if you have a more generous budget, that is. It is more of a luxury location. It has supposedly some of the best beaches in Montenegro, as well as fancy hotels, restaurants and yachts. 
It also has a much more modern feel than Kotor. Now that we have covered where to set up base, let's look at some tourist attractions and things to do in Montenegro. And in Montenegro, you should not miss a visit to the old capital. Who knows, you might even decide to stay for a couple of weeks. Cetince, sorry for butchering the names once again, was founded in the 15th century and was the royal capital for many centuries. It is known for its beautiful foreign embassy buildings, which today have been turned into museums, galleries and restaurants. For those of you that would like to know more about the country's history, you should visit the National Museum of Montenegro while here. Another attraction that is worth a visit is the 18th century Cetince Monastery. It is a beautiful stone building, half surrounded by mountains, and the inside is painted with absolutely lovely frescoes. Plus, it holds the mummified hand of St. John the Baptist and part of the True Cross, making it a very special place for Christians. Next, let's take a closer look at another beautiful little town by the coast, Perast. We've already talked about Perast, remember? If you enjoy Couture, but you would like to do without the giant cruise ships in the bay, Paris might be your place. While you still will get a lot of tourists in Paris, its harbor is too shallow for the massive ships to dock. Paris too enchants with a lot of old Venetian flair, with the gorgeous mountains in the back. I have already mentioned the island of Our Lady in the sea, but Paris itself is a beauty in its own right. The little town has 20 baroque palazzos to admire and you can spend your day or days strolling through small alleyways opening up to beautiful squares and 18 small little stone churches. From Kotor or Herceg Novi you can also take a boat tour to the Blue Cave. This natural wonder is only accessible by joining an organized tour. The cave actually gets its name from the almost otherworldly blue light that floods it. Montenegro's coastline is so beautiful, you could honestly just spend a couple of weeks driving it in its entirety, stopping at every little village. You will find something new to discover at each stop. One such beautiful stop would be Ulcinj. It is mostly known for having Europe's longest beach, the Velika Plaza. This makes it a great destination for some beach time or water sport activities. Moving away from the coast and a few miles inland from the coastal town of Bar, you will find a beautiful little town, Stari Bar. It is located at the foot of Mount Rumica. In the early Middle Ages, Stari Bar was ruled by the Byzantine Empire, followed by the Venetians, the Serbian Empire, the Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. So you can see that the little town has had a very colorful history with many battles. As you walk through the abandoned ruins, climb up to the remains of the old fortress and look down to the bay where the city of Bar lies, you can almost feel the centuries past here. If you would like to move further inland, you could head to Lake Skoder, which I first introduced in the Digital Nomad Guide to Albania. Since Montenegro shares Lake Skoder with Albania, it is the largest lake in southern Europe. It is also part of one of the largest national parks in Montenegro giving you ample opportunity to spend the time in nature and by the water. Watch birds. It is one of Europe's best bird habitats. Go for hikes. Spend time on and in the water and more. Other things to discover are the small ancient island monasteries and prisons and marvel at the breathtaking carpets of water lilies swimming on the lake. Let's keep heading inland and stop at one more spiritual destination before moving to one of the most beautiful national parks in the country as a last suggestion before the visa details. But first, visit Ostrog Monastery, possibly Montenegro's most impressive monastery. It was built right into an almost vertical mountain wall, high up into the large rock of Ostroška Greda and is the country's most sacred Orthodox pilgrimage destination. Though it was originally built as a refuge against the Ottoman Empire, it is now a meeting place of all the major confessions in the country, the Orthodox, the Catholics and the Muslims. 
it has a stunning interior with two cave churches that feature beautiful frescoes, some of which are painted directly onto the rock wall. There are still monks living in the monastery, and like I mentioned, it is a very sacred place to many, so keep that in mind when you choose your attire for your visit. Even further inland, you will find yourself in the absolutely breathtaking mountainous landscape of Montenegro. Make a stop at Dumitor National Park for some time outdoors. This is an absolute paradise for hikers and outdoor enthusiasts. The Dumitor Massif is located in the Dinaric Alps, with its highest peak being Bobotov Cook at 2,523 meters. The park is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and was formed by glaciers and underground streams. It still, to this day, features 18 glacier lakes and the Tara River Canyon, Europe's deepest gorge and the second deepest in the world after the Grand Canyon. It is also home to some pretty impressive local wildlife, such as wolves and bears. Tara River is also famous for whitewater rafting excursions. Even multi-day rafting and canyoning trips are available if you wish to really spend some time in the wild. Not to mention other outdoor activities like horseback riding, paragliding, mountain biking and climbing. If you visit during the winter, Dumitor is also a great skiing location. Now that I've given you an extensive overview over Montenegro and its beauty, let's talk a little bit about the visa options. What options do you have if you wish to stay here as a digital nomad? As usual, the easiest visa option for digital nomads that would like to stay for only a couple of weeks is a tourist visa. Over a hundred countries are allowed to enter Montenegro without a visa. This includes citizens of the EU, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and Japan. Most tourist visas are valid for 90 days, but double check that since there's a couple of countries that are only allowed to stay for 30 days. For longer stays, I always recommend a digital nomad visa when possible. Unfortunately, even though a digital nomad visa for Montenegro has been in the works since 2021 and has been promised to be released in 2022, it is delayed. It is supposed to be released in 2023, but there is no real information on when yet. But we do know some details of what's to come and can make some speculation about the rest. Here's what we know. The visa is focused on digital nomads, so individuals that are able to work remotely for a company outside of Montenegro via information technology. So either as a freelancer, either as a business owner or employed and working remotely. The visa duration will be for two years and can be extended for another two years, giving you four years in total in the country before you would have to leave for six months before you can enter again on the same visa scheme. This gives you a fantastic way not only to stay in Montenegro for a while, but also to discover the rest of the Balkans. Digital nomads are also exempt from paying income taxes in Montenegro. Then there are some things that we can speculate on. It is, for example, very likely that you will need the following documents. Passport, proof of accommodation, health insurance, proof of a certain amount of regular income, though we don't know what the threshold will be yet, and possibly a clean criminal record. So for now, unfortunately, your best bet is to enter on the tourist visa. If you wish to stay in the country for longer, check out the digital nomad visa to Croatia or Albania or any of the other Balkan regions that I have reviewed so far. Over here, you can also see my latest video about the digital nomad visa to Hungary, which is not far off either. And if you are even more interested in the region, check out next week's video about the digital nomad visa to Bosnia and Herzegovina, a truly special place. Until then, thanks so much for your time and I'll see you here in the next one. Keep exploring. Bye bye.